Sure. All right, so again, starting over, I'm gonna start um, talking about plants, bugs, and worms, uh, basically about invasive species. I'm not gonna go into a lot of management information. I'm just gonna cover some of the, the ones that are we're most concerned about right now. And I, I love this post. So I know that some of you, I'll keep moving back and forth so that you know you can don't have to post all the time. And so uh, you know, these are the programs that I that I manage right now. I have a, a wonderful team of five pr very professional and exceptional women that work in our program, the plant health program. And again, we we manage nursery and greenhouse inspection and any any place that sells plants. Arborist licensing, apiary licensing, so beekeepers, uh, integrated pest management program, both school IPM and the, the main integrated pest management council, which probably most of you have never heard of. And then we also uh, work with pest detection and the, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey, uh, which is something we work together with USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service on. So we, we work in a lot of different areas and keeps my brain moving in lots of different directions. I also manage hemp. So if you are growing hemp, I'm the person that licenses you to, to grow hemp, which has completely crashed. There's, there were only 12 growers this year on less than five acres. So that crop has really you know, gone way down from 2019 when there were 200 growers and 2,500 acres in Maine. So talking about invasive species, I think it's important to define what an invasive species is. You know, basically it's a species that is not native. It has not been here um, prior to colonization and it is not native to an ecoregion. So if you look at this map, it shows the, the higher level ecoregions in, in our area. And, you know, basically if a plant is native to, to here, it's, it's still part of that same ecoregion. So it can be outside of Maine. It doesn't necessarily have to all be in Maine. And it's a organism that their introduction is causing problems, either economic or ecological, or maybe harming human health. You know, things like the number of invasive mosquitoes or you know, certain other organisms that are bearing diseases that, that, that hurt us and kill us. So native species are not invasive species. And a lot of people, they look at staghorn sumac and say it's invasive. Well, it's not, you know, it's a native plant. It's really important habitat for lots of different birds and other small mammals. And it, it is a colonizer. It can spread you know, quite readily, but it's not an invasive because it, it's native. Same thing goes for poison ivy. You, know, you can see you know, poison ivy is a good, a good pollinator plant. And basically that's the picture I took at my camp on uh, Flying Pond in Mount Vernon, where you, know, you can see the flowers and the bees coming to it all day long. And there's the berries and those berries are nutritious for birds and small mammals. And it's not an invasive. It does cause problems. It causes you know, human effects, but uh, overall, it's a really important native plant, and if you can leave it alone, that's really what you should do. And, you know, why be concerned about invasive species? I think it's because we love Maine, we want to be outdoors, we want to have the same kind of environment that we've enjoyed for years. Um, as I mentioned to some folks before, I'm a ninth generation Mainer, I grew up in Farmington, and I've pretty much lived here all my life. I did move all the way to southern New Hampshire for five years, so... Um, you know, that was a, a, a big, big trip. But, you know, basically, uh, um, I think that we need to be worried about invasive species because they are changing the character of our forests and our lakes and, you know, in our marine waters and, and all over. And they, they don't fit into our ecological puzzle, basically, is that they can fill up areas and they maybe they do add to biodiversity if you look at all of biodiversity. But Maybe they don't because they are bullying other plants that go away. So you you get you don't, you don't always get an extra plant. You lose a few plants because you've got one that comes in. So it really doesn't fit in our ecological puzzle. So I'm going to start out looking at terrestrial plants. You know, here's a couple of 
famous invasive terrestrial plants, knotweed as, as well as barberry, uh, very invasive throughout the state of Maine and you know, really a problem in many different areas causing flooding problems, barberry causing problems with forest regeneration. It, it really you know, creates a lot of problems. So just like I mentioned before, an invasive plant, it still it needs to have some sort of effects on ecology, the, the economy, or, or humans. And generally we think of them as that they're spreading in minimally managed habitats. So there are a lot of plants out there that they do colonize, they're not native, but we don't call them invasive because they don't jump from one habitat to another. That's one of the key things that we look for and it's part of the, the law as well. Um, one of the handouts that I have you know, gives you information about the plants that we have banned. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we go through to try to ban the plants. And you know, one of the things that's really important is looking at, do they jump from one habitat to another? So when we look at exotic species, you know, really most of them are not invasive. When you go from a hundred down to 10, that might be naturalized, become established, but they really don't jump from one habitat to another. That gets you down to maybe one or 5% of the plants. So it's not, you know, not every single one. And you know, how do they harm? Well, here you've got bittersweet. It, it does multiple harm. It does harm by basically completely pulling down the, the plant or the tree. It covers over its foliage so that it can't get any light. And it also girdles it by choking it with going a vine going around and around the, the stem. And you know, here it just shows you know, what it does to the stem eventually girdling it and killing the plant that way. So it's, it's a triple threat, basically. It, it starves the plant, it chokes the plant, and it pulls the plant down. So it's a, a really serious problem. Something like uh, the, the, the garlic mustard actually has allelopathic chemicals that it exudes from its, its um, roots so that it's stopping other plants from growing by putting out chemicals that prevent them, similar to you know, maybe something like a black walnut where that has juglins. I forget exactly what the, the chemical is in, in garlic mustard. And most of them displace our native trees and shrubs and wildflowers. That's a big part of the problem is that they're just bullies. They grow really fast and come in and, and take out, you know, wetlands like this where you get phragmites and they take out all of the, the, the cattails. And so you, know, you alter the habitat, you prevent forest regeneration, like I said before, with something like barberry, where it just completely covers the forest floor. You come in and take that crop off, and then there's no way for anything to grow back up through there, or it takes a lot, the, the forest succession takes a lot, lot longer, you know, maybe to the point of not getting any succession for 50 years or something like that. It dominates the site. And in a lot of situations, they're, they're just harming the food web. So you are excluding native plants, which are extremely important to caterpillars, which are extremely important to birds and, and so on. I'm sure you've probably heard some of the, the work that Doug Tallamy has done and the books that he's written on bringing nature home and things like that, where if we don't have these really important trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals that feed the insects, then we lose that trophic level, which then feeds a lot of higher trophic levels like those. So what can we do about them? You know, ideally, we prevent them from getting here. So that's why we are banning certain plants. That's why we have quarantines. Um, that's why we work together with the, uh, the Border Patrol, as well as the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And the network of states that we have in the, in the National Plant Board, we're all trying to work together to prevent things from being spread around. Oftentimes it's just slowing the spread as opposed to stopping it because it's really hard to you know, stop everything. And once you get something started, if you can't do really early detection and rapid response, it gets established and it becomes exponentially harder to, to manage with that thing. So we are trying to prevent, we're trying to identify and assess. You know, we are always looking for reports from people to try to find things early. 
And you, know, you can report it a, a lot of different places. That's a couple of them, horticulture at main.gov or IMAP Invasive is a place that you can learn to actually post things and pictures that go directly into a database that we're always looking at and trying to, to see where you know, problems may lie. Um, we need to prioritize for sure because there's way too many invasive things out there to, to be all managed. And then control comes into play where oftentimes we're working with the main natural areas program because they're trying to protect really important habitats. So very, very rare habitats. And that's where a lot of the, the state time is, is taken in terms of trying to manage invasive plants, especially is in those really rare habitats. Forest Service doing the same kind of thing, uh, releasing biocontrols and things like that. And then you need to monitor. You need to constantly be monitoring and looking to see are you having um, effects? Are you, you know, is something spreading? What are the things that you need to do? And then repeat and you know, keep repeating. So this is hydrilla here. So this is uh, one of the most invasive aquatic plants that we've ever had. And um, actually he, he had a good, a, a good uh, did a good job of eradicating it from one of the lakes in Maine. So identification of plants, it's really important. You know, here we've got some buckthorn and you know basically it does require a lot of practice there are a lot of apps today that you can use that can help kind of narrow it down and you really need to get outside and, and look i use the go botany site a lot and then as i mentioned before we have this uh, invasive plant field guide it is really helpful in terms of ident identification and also has tips on managing and that's uh, something that the main natural areas program put together with a group uh, a few years ago. But this just gives you an idea of what um, it looks like on the inside. The gout weed is one that everybody loves, right? And I'm selling it for 20, not 30. And, um, you know, basically it gives you information about the range and you know, why it's invasive and, and how to manage as well. So I did want to just touch base on, we just recently added 30 new plants to the do not sell list is what we call it. It's the uh, a regulation that has been in place since about 2017, where you know we're looking at plants that have been sold in the past and finding out that they're really invasive and we want them to be stopped from being sold because we don't want more and more of them to spread out into the state of Maine. So we recently um, hit the five-year mark where we're automatically required in the rule to go back and look again to see if there are new plants that ought to be added to the list and we can add at any time and we get reports and we um, there is a way for you to go on our website and actually nominate plants to be added to the list and we did add two of them because of that this time around um, it takes uh, quite a bit of time to go through this process uh, we have a stakeholder group that gets together and you know basically takes the information from something like the advisory list of invasive plants that the main natural areas program works on this is a non-regulatory list. It's a huge list. And so we take plants from that list. We also take them from the, the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Network, uh, which is doing a lot of work on all different types of invasive um, species and how climate change is exacerbating them or changing ranges and, and things like that. And so we started out with 173 species that were potentially suspect. Um, it was cut down to 112 fairly quickly because a bunch of them are not sold and we only regulate plants that are sold in this particular regulation. That's all we can regulate. And then after doing a lot of analysis and looking at some of them that were hitchhiker plants that didn't, you know, it, it was going to be really rare. Again, you have to prioritize. So we brought that down to 63 plants that we did a really deep dive in, looking to see if they actually are invasive, do they jump from habitat to habitat? Is there data there? We've got to have data in order to justify adding plants to the list. And we came up with 30 plants that we added to the list. And, you know, basically we, you know, we look at it very carefully. We have a very diverse stakeholder group that includes people that are selling plants as well as those that are managing plants and all over the place. And you know, basically we added 30 species to the do not sell list. We created a new watch list of 29 plants. 
And these are ones that in the next five years, they will definitely get reviewed again, or maybe even before then. Most of them were not jumping from habitat to habitat, or they could really overwinter here at this point, but eventually they probably will be able to overwinter. And we did put um, Rugosa rose or Rosa rugosa into a special category, um, which we are calling uh, a species of uh, invasive species of concern. And basically, you will see people that are selling Rugosa rose this coming year will have to have signs like this up where they sell it. And the sign basically uh, is warning you about, I think I have a copy of that here is warning you about the fact that it can be invasive on the coast, to not plant it on the coast. There are um, suggestions for alternative plants like Virginia rose or other roses or sweet fern, red chokeberry, number of other things there. So nurseries will have to have either these signs up or tags on individual plants that warn you about that. Um, it's not a plant that ended up being completely banned because it can be used inland where it won't become invasive and it can be an important plant in some places where you have really high salt, like on, in parking lots and stuff like that because it's very salt tolerant. So looking at the, the list itself, I know you can't read that, but there are copies of this that were over on the, um, the table over there that has the, the list of plants. Uh, you know, basically, this was the original list of 33. And then this is the 30 new plants that we added. Uh, just a couple that are pretty common, something like calorie pear or Bradford pear is one that has become incredibly invasive across the United States. And it's one that we definitely decided to, to ban here in Maine. Um, you know, something like Colt's foot is another one that's pretty common. Uh, we, we regulated another privet and uh, Russian olive. So there's a, a number of plants there that have been sold in the past that uh, starting January 1st of this coming year, we're not legal to sell anymore. So if you see the list and you see someone selling something like that, please let us know. We'll work with them to, to get them to stop selling it. We've had extremely good compliance for the, the first 33 plants. Uh, our nursery growers in Maine pretty much understand how important this is and have had um, excellent compliance with it. And then we did create the watch list. And, and most of these are plants that either don't overwinter well here right now. You know, even something like butterfly bush is one that may eventually be banned. A couple of the um, different bamboos that may become a problem. So you know, a lot of different plants here. Wisterias right now don't overwinter well, but they're very invasive further south. Same thing goes for um, the, the Japanese tree lilac. Um, you know, lots of plants that people are, you know, buying and using, but probably will eventually become invasive species in Maine as well as they have in areas further south. So again, you know, with Rugosa rose, they've got to put out the signs or tag the plants, and you know, there will be recommendations if you are on the coast to, to replace them with uh, different plants. Wanted to highlight just a couple of plants that are early detections. They just are getting started in Maine. They're really serious invaders south of us. Even in New Hampshire, they have a pretty serious problem with silt grass now in some forested areas. So this is one that does move in sometimes with nursery plants. Um, be on the lookout for it. That's why I, I gave you the, the little cards here that give you a lot more information about how to identify and, and, and you know, how to report it. Right now, it's really in York County and Georgetown. There's also a, a little bit of an infestation in uh, Oxford County as well. And so we're really trying to you know, stop this from becoming a bigger problem because like uh, barberry, it completely, completely dominates the forest floor. It's very shade tolerant and it can really um, take out all those spring ephemeral plants and everything else that is supposed to be under the forest. And um, it's a it's a big bully. So you know, a couple of things that make it a little bit easier to identify is that it has this kind of pale silvery stripe down the middle of the of the leaf. Um, it has this habit of growing tall and then falling over and then rerooting. Um, it is one that seeds really late in the season, and um, one way of managing it is to pull it out before it goes to seed. 
And that's what's been happening in, in a couple of those spots that we, I, I mentioned earlier. So a lot of information on that card to help you to ID it, how to report it, and all of that. And then the other one that just came in this year, we had our first reports of mile a minute vine. This is an extremely invasive plant. It grows six, you know, six feet a day, and uh, six inches in a day, I mean, not six feet. And um, it, it showed up in, in Booth Bay this year, and we found it in four other places, Winthrop and Topsom, and I can't think of the fourth one. And, and so it's just becoming a problem potentially here. Um, it looks a lot like a lot of other plants, which I'll show in a second. It does have this very triangular leaf. It has barbs, so a lot of the lookalikes don't have barbs. If you go to try to pull this plant out, you're going to know it. <laughs> it's going to rip your, your hands apart, basically. It also has this funny ophria leaf that is at the nodes and also where the flowers and, and berries are. So it's, it's very different. But here you can see where it's become extremely invasive in Pennsylvania, covering this whole bank and climbing up trees, similar to what uh, the um, bittersweet does. So there are a lot of other things that kind of look like it, but um, they, they have either kind of lobes in the triangle or lobes that stick out or completely different leaf structures, but they are vines. And we had over 300 reports from people about these and the majority of them were vine leaves actually. So, you know, a lot of people reported either tear thumbs or vine weeds or, um, you know, those, those plants which are still weeds and problems, but not like mile a minute weeds. Mile a minute weeds, it's, it's in its own category. So one of the things I like to do is, um, you know, offer some ways of, of choosing other plants because, you know, sometimes people, they just want that plant, you know, especially like something like burning bush. People are always saying, I want a burning bush, you know, but you can't buy it in Maine. We don't want you to go outside of Maine and bring it into Maine. You're not supposed to import it into the state either. This is my favorite site for finding native plants. So this is the, the Native Plant Trust Plant Finder. And basically you can go in and put in all kinds of data that you want, that you know about your soil, about your sunlight, you know, all those um, typical things, your hardiness zone, all kinds of things that will give you a nice palette of plants that you can choose from that are native in, in your particular eco-region because they, they use the eco-regions as well. So if you just Google Native Plant Finder and Native Plant Trust, you'll find the site. If you're trying to find native plants in Maine, the Wild Seed Project, if you go to their website, they have a place um, up here, if you go to uh, learn, the drop down will give you a choice of where to buy native plants. And then they have a bunch of different states there. You can choose Maine and it will give you, oh, I think they're up to like 25 or so different places that are selling native plants. We used to have a list that we um, had worked on together with Loa Stack years ago at Cooperative Extension that we had on the, the, the Maine Yardscaping Partnership website. But that's really out of date. This is much more. Um, current. Any questions about plants before I move on to forestry stuff and stuff like that? Yes. So with something like mile a minute vine, we get a report of that. Immediately, we send out somebody from either the main natural areas program or one of my nursery inspectors, and we go and, and pull the plant out and try to find out where it came from so that we can then basically go back to the, the source and say, you got a problem, please take care of this so that we don't keep getting plants that are importing something like my limit line. And then we will go back and monitor those sites for probably five years to see if um, anything actually did develop. Fortunately, with Milo Minute Vine, only one out of the four sites that we found it in had mature plants. All the rest were brand new vines that had just grown and we just pulled them out. We don't think we're ever going to find anything there. And Thompson, there was one that looked like it might have had been there for a number of years and might have produced some fruit. So we're going to be looking carefully there. But that's the kind of thing that we do is we'll go out and try to tackle it right away control it in any way that we can. 
and then try to figure out what the source was so that we can stop it from coming in from whatever that source was. Um, we, we do that, we call that a trace back, and we do that with the network that I talked about before, the national plant service. So I'm connected to all the other state plant regulatory officials and all the other states. And so they would know, you know, if I found out it came from X nursery, they would go and inspect that nursery to try to find if they had a problem and enforce their laws in that situation. There are there is the potential if a, if a plant is sold widely on the internet or if we know it's sold somewhere else, yeah, it can get on that list. So basically the, the, the law is about sale in Maine or import internet. So it does include I go out as well as our other um, assistant horticulturists and look at websites to try to find things like that. We get pretty good compliance. Um, you'd be surprised the big box stores usually take stuff off right away or they put in controls so that if you put in your, your zip code that the main zip code, it will say, no, you can't buy this plant. And we're checking that you know, fairly often. Um, I've been working with a group at the National Plant Board to try to get that done a little bit more effectively at the, the national level. And some, some folks are easier to work with than others. Amazon tends to be fairly easy, but Etsy and, and some of the smaller sites are really hard to work with. So it's um, it's not perfect, you know, it's never working. How long, 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 well, as the uh, area gets moister and gets more shady, you're going to have more moss, and especially this year, everything was a lot moister. Okay. So moss, you know, moss proliferated as well as some other organisms. Okay. Yeah. Take one more and then move on. And you will find the moss as well. Yep. That really is the only solution doing cut surface treatment. So you cut the shrub and then treat the stem. Um, you can either do basal application or cut surface treatment. And you know, otherwise, it's going to be too time consuming, um, too difficult to manage. Other methods of trying to control it don't work very well. Um, they'll just come down. So, you know, in that situation where you're trying to maintain the board and keep yourself from getting ripped apart, and that's really all that you can do. Um, almost all of these plants, if you cut them down, you get more. Yeah. They, 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 they sprout a lot more. Bittersweet, yeah, yeah, all of those things. So, if it's a woody, if it's a woody invasive plant, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you cut it, it's just going to come back and probably come back with multiple steps. So it makes it even more difficult. So it's the, the minimal amount of herbicide that you do to treat the stem of the plant after you cut it, that risk is minuscule. If you follow the label, protect yourself from it, that is the, the real risk. There's no risk. There's no risk to you, there's no risk to the environment because you're putting a tiny little dab of the material on the surface of what you just it's not like you're spraying it all over the place or, or anything like I got a lot more to cover but I can keep you know the, you mentioned basal farm application. Yeah <clears throat> but that wasn't aggressive so where does a lay person get information about how to do well, one I would recommend you get a pesticide applicator plant. So that gives you all the information, or you could buy the manual and learn from the manual that's specific to right of way management. So, right of way management really um, provides all kinds of information about the, the proper application when you're doing 
legal application or tax service treatment or something like that, or to you know go to cooperative extension or um, have somebody come in that's uh, that's well in them who is a um, an expert on invasive plant control. And I mean, you can go on the internet and we'll tell you how to do it too. And if you read the label carefully, it will tell you how to do it. How, you know, how far up the stem to tree, how much to apply, how to mix it, all of that's right on the pesticide label. And that's what you should be reading cover to cover before you use it in. <laughs> there are little likes for stilt grass. Um, one of the key things that you can tell the native grass from stilt grass is that the native grass has got hairs on them, and if you take your hand and pull it up over it, you'll feel that um, you know, touching it basically. With stilt grass, it's not there, it's smooth. So that's um, there are a couple of grasses that are similar. But if you you know if you look at this card, I think and you see that you know what's there in terms of the the um, ways of identifying it, you probably won't go wrong. And you can always send pictures. If you send a picture to horticulture at main.gov, we'll ID it um, or we'll you know figure it out one way or the other. The one that's um, got a toehold in Maine that is really concerning to me is heat space So, you know, we, we keep losing trees. This is a really important tree, really important wildlife tree, not loved by foresters and, you know, not loved by those that are growing wood, but it's a really important tree in terms of wildlife, habitat, and uh, it uh, is getting wiped out, basically. And so beech leaf disease, you know, it started out from being reported in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And it looks like it's caused by a nematode, this whitey lincus pernating, and um, seems to be Penidae, which seems to be the, the likely source of the disease. I think that they're still trying to figure out if there's something that goes along with it, but certainly the, the plants that have the, the symptoms of a ton of these, as you can see here. Um, they call this the wool, the nematode wool. That all came out of one leaf. Uh, it's um, amazing how many get packed inside. And basically, where you see these dark stripes, that's where all the nematodes are. And they're, you know, they're causing cellular damage. And you know, so this is one that has spread very quickly, you know, very quickly within 10 years, right across the east, came into Maine very quickly. And um, you know it's it, it's really concerning because it has spread quite a bit in Maine as well. Um, here you can see 2021. It was just kind of in this mid coast area. 2022 it went further out, and um, 2023 you can see it really. Um, it's been found all over. You know maybe that's also because more monitoring was done. It may have been there all along, but um, it certainly has. It has bloomed throughout Maine and most of our counties now. Um, um, so I'm getting to that. <laughs> so if we look at um, beech leaf disease, the early symptoms are the stripe. So you look up through the foliage and, and it's on a sunny day and you'll see all those stripes on the leaves. And then eventually the, those leaves start to thicken and they start to curl. Um, also, it gets on copper beaches, European beaches and oriental beaches. And on them, it tends to just curl them right away. Um, it does cause problems as well as losing buds and leaves. So um, really stresses the plant in multiple ways. Here it's reducing the photosynthesis, photosynthetic ability of the tree. It's also losing leaves and buds, which then further reduces it. So it looks like, you know, on average, two to five years for saplings to die, maybe as much as six years for mature trees. But that's something that's been kind of figured out in areas where they don't also have beech bark disease. So when we have beech bark disease and beech leaf disease, we're seeing trees going really fast. Um, I don't know, you know, I do a lot of, of mountain climbing and hiking, and we've done a lot of hiking in the hot area where we've had this for a while. 
you can go on trails where all the beach trees are completely defoliated throughout the whole season, basically. They don't even, they're not putting on leaves <laughs> late in the season anymore. You know, this does knock them out fairly quickly. And with any tree, if you take it you know, defoliated early, it will refoliate. But the beaches are getting defoliated or they're not refoliated. And you know, that means that they're not going to last much. So maybe even mature trees are dying within two or three months. I don't, you know, I, I can't say that based on hard evidence, but I suspect that's going to happen. Moving into Emerald Ash Borer, you know, this is one that um, it came in, you know, basically from the north first, which was, wasn't where we were expecting to find it. It came in um, you know, up in Mount Alaska up in 2018, and then we did find it coming across the border in New Hampshire in, in the York County area. Um, it is one that you almost never see this bullet-shaped beetle, um, very iridescent green, smaller than a penny. Um, oftentimes people will report this tiger beetle as, as being it. It is out basically a similar time as the emerald ash borer. And we want to get as many reports as possible because we want to keep track of, of where this, this is. We do make these V-shaped holes in the bark. We make these really serpentine galleries just under the bark where we breathe. <laughs> And one of the ways that you can really start to see the effects is you'll see the top starting to die out. You'll see this what's called blonding from woodpeckers where they're pecking off the outer bark, trying to get those um, you know, scrumptious little grubs that are underneath there. You'll see epicornic shoots or even um, shoots coming from the root system. And then this time of year, once we get snow, you can really see this when you see the blonding. You'll see blonding on the the, uh, the bowl, and then you'll see all kinds of plucked off bark on, on the, the uh, snow. So if you see something like this, really should report it. Um, you know, we want to know, you know where um, this insect is showing up. It's not been found much further east on the coast than Brunswick. Um, it has been found you know, further east up north or further north. And we did just expand the quarantine. so. If you're um, like you are in this area, um, you can't move firewood or ash or anything like that um, outside of that quarantine area without um, working with the Forest Service to have a, a compliance agreement um, to make sure that you're not spreading emerald ash borer. Any hardwood firewood can't move outside of this quarantine. And so basically it's, it's really important to observe that because it jumped from Cumberland County all the way up to Penobscot and Piscataquis County um, in just a, a couple of years because of us. We move it that far. It only moves about two to 10 miles on its own, mostly two. If there's not enough uh, ash for it to find, it might go as far as 10. And here you can see the areas where it's actually been found in red and the areas that we think are infested in orange up north. Uh, we just added a couple of townships here to the, the, the northern quarantine. It doesn't seem to be moving very fast up there, probably because it's so cold and it goes, it has a longer life cycle up there, but it, it, it still does just fine. It's not going to die out up there or anything. It's also up here in New Brunswick and it's in Quebec over here. And it's, it's on the other side of Maine as well. And here you can see the, the satellite populations that were found in the last couple of years um, up here in the Newport area, also in the Oakland Waterville area, and then over here in, in northern um, Oxford County. So before that, you know, the, the most northern it was was here. So we found it in Lewis and Auburn, um, all three of these and these two, which obviously came from probably people moving. And so now, you know, we do have the quarantine that extends pretty much at least two towns away from any area that we um, feel is infested. And we added these towns in between because we just were quite sure that um, it's going to end up there fairly soon. We also quarantine the other states that have emerald ash borer, so they can't be moving you know, infested material into the state of Maine, as well as the, um, the Canadian provinces that are around us that have um, a mobile war established. So one of the things that the Forest Service is doing is as we find areas that are pretty well infested with emerald ash borer, they can re uh, release these um, different parasitic wasps 
they don't sting, they're really tiny. This shows them much larger than they really are. And um, you know, they are very specific to emerald ash borer. It takes 15 or 20 years to vet any of these biological controls now to make sure that they're very specific to whatever they're trying to control, that we don't end up with cane toads and things like that anymore. That's that's way gone. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, doesn't mean that it's 100% perfect, but it, it's really you know very low risk at this point. And so these have to be released in areas where there are emerald ash borer, so they've got to have something to feed on. They're not going to save the any of the mature trees. The hope is that they will establish and then eventually new young ash will be preserved. And they'll be able to grow and we'll still have ash in our forest, probably never as much as we had to begin with, which was about 2% of the forest, 4% of our, our wood forest. And of course, you know, it has cultural implications with the Native Americans, the, the brown or black ash is part of their creation story. It's what they make their baskets out of. Uh, we've been working with them for you know, 10 or 15 years, basically getting ready for this. And there's not much we can do other than quarantine and try to get people to not move it around. It's going to move on its own, but slowly. And it does, it takes about, um, you know, four years to kill a tree, sometimes a little bit faster, really depends. And unfortunately, it, it kills the black ash and green ash completely. White ash seems to be, um, there are a few white ash that are resistant. So he, here you can see where the Forest Service has done releases in, in New Hampshire and Maine, both in the northern and the southern infestations. And there's um, always looking for new sites. Um, Bowie and Carolyn works with that and um, always looking for new sites to add more releases. One that's also in this area is the winter moth. Um, people were starting to report them um, early December, starting to see the moths coming out. And this is not a good time. Well, it's never a good time to have lights on all night long, to tell you the truth. Part of the problems that we're having with not enough insects, it's not pesticides, it's urbanization, it's lights. Lights are killing tons of insects. And you know, this is one of the ones, if you've got lights on, it's gonna to come to you, same thing as brown tail moth. And so you wanna keep your lights on, um, motion detectors are not on all night long. Um, there's research going on at the University of Maine, Angela Mech is looking at different types of lights that may be less attractive, <clears throat> so that maybe we can change our outdoor lights to be um, less attractive to these um, insects. So unfortunately with this one, it's easily passed around when you do um, trading plants. Um, in the uh, in June, November time, it's in the soil. The pupa looks like a, a piece of soil. So if you're gonna trade plants with someone, you should bear root the plants and you should wash all the soil off the plants at your property before you transfer the plant to someone else. So the same thing goes for like plant sales. And so this one is up and down the coast. Um, you can see the areas that are darker are the ones where they've had the, the, the number of moths have been the higher counts. Um, this one also has a biological control, which is a fly. And you can see releases and how they have helped to reduce the number of, of winter moths in, in certain areas. They haven't been as effective as they have been in Massachusetts, where they pretty much wiped out the winter moth populations down there. Um, hopefully, they'll become more and more effective as time goes on. Here you can see the fly. It you know, looks like a house fly, basically. And this is the kind of um, thing that they'll install in the ground to have the, the fly um, come out of the pupa and then hopefully um, parasitize the, the, the winter moth um, caterpillars. And so you can see areas where they, they have been releasing them, the parasitism rates and uh, release times and how many they've been releasing. It's been harder and harder to get them because the Massachusetts populations have been crashing. So you've got to have live winter moth in order to um, get the, the flies and, and rear the flies. So it's it's been a challenge to get enough of them to release. I'm sure you all know brown tail moth. Um, this is the one that causes rashes. Not everybody's allergic to it. Uh, I know I get the rash and it lasts for weeks and weeks and not a nice thing, but um, here, here you see the female. That's why it's called the brown tail. Is it, it's um, you know, abdomen end of its abdomen is brown, 
that has um, white wings otherwise. And then in the springtime, when you see all of those white moths that are on buildings and everything else, those are 99% males. So you know, people will recommend that you try to trap them, put out lights or water and stuff like that. Do not do that. You're just making it worse. You're attracting, um, you know, you're attracting, I think I have a picture now. I guess I took it out. You're attracting a, you know, a zillion of these, and the males will see the males, and the females are all off laying out. So you're not controlling the females. Um, we had a problem with a couple of, of Home Depots that had their lights on all night. We go and we look, and the whole side of the building is covered with the moths. And then we go look at the plant that they have and find all these females running around the plant. So it's, you know, it's do not try to trap. Um, there is a, a dashboard now that you can go to that will give you information about um, what's being found and the surveys that are done. They do aerial surveys as well as they go out and look at um, webs on trees. So these are overwintering and webs as caterpillars, and they do those counts. And here you can see you know, the aerial survey and the results of that, seeing where um, there's been feeding in August with the really tiny caterpillars. And then all these little dots are places where they found webs, certain numbers of webs, the, the darker ones are more webs. Um, so this is something that needs to be updated right now. It's not completely up to date. I just talked to Alison Kennedy about it um, a couple of days ago. They're trying to get the data in there. But you can look at your town and look at areas where you know, they're finding those populations. And so you can be prepared to either put the labs or you know, maybe do, take other measures to, to reduce the population. Another really bad one on the coast, as you are here, is the hemlock really adelgid. We just expanded the quarantine on this as well. You can see where it was um, detected um, back in 2022, um, outside of kind of the area that it's always been in along the coast. We don't know, but it may be related to climate change as um, things warm up. This, this insect is controlled by really cold winters. So if we don't have um, really cold winters, um, it can um, spread that much further. And you know, so we found it even up in Gardner, um, well outside the quarantine. So the new quarantine goes all the way up into Franklin County, Somerset, and um, um, Penobscot County because we expect that you know, it's going to be moving further north and we want to make sure that people aren't moving it, um, outside of, of those areas. If you've never seen it before, it's a little pot in the aphid. Basically, it's a, a part of a delgid. Um, it was hard to see this past year because we had so much rain. It actually washed away the wool. So it was hard to detect this past year. That wool is probably starting to come back now, so you may be able to detect it in, in forest areas um, now. And unfortunately, we also have the elongate hemlock scale, and where we have both the hemlock woolly adelgid and the elongate hemlock scale, it plunks trees out really fast. Hemlock woolly adelgid on its own, a tree can survive five years, seven years. You add um, elongate hemlock scale, and forget it, it's done within maybe two or three years. They have a really bad problem with this. In southern New Hampshire, and we are definitely seeing it in the forest now in southern New England, coastal New England. Uh, we've been seeing it in nurseries for a while. So I've already mentioned this, but you know, firewood. You know, please don't move firewood. We're now within a quarantine area, but even before that, ideally, never move firewood more than ten miles, fifty miles at the most. Um, it's so easy to transport something that you can't tell is there. Um, that's how emerald ash borer got moved across the country very quickly. Oak wilt is something that's moving across the country and in places it's in New York. If we get oak wilt, it's really bad. If we get, if we get Asian longhorn beetle, that will take out maples. I mean, there's just so many threats out there. So it's better to, if you're going up the camp or you're, you're traveling into northern Maine, don't bring, bring fire to you, buy it, buy it locally. Or, and you know, make an arrangement that way. So we want to, to you know, help slow the spread of these invasives. Another place that you can um, do reports of invasive things is bugwatch at maine.gov. Um, Forest Health also has their own report form that you can use. So there's multiple ways to, to report these things. And if you have any concern, if you see something that's completely different, you've never seen it before, 
don't hesitate to, to send it to the court, especially with a good, clear photo that we can um, help you identify. So one thing that we don't have yet, but we've had some reports of is spotted lanternfly. But there is a, a couple of them back there in, in one of the, the little tubes. Um, this is one that could become a problem for mostly vineyards. So we don't have a lot of vineyards in Maine. Um, it does attack some trees. It could be a problem, you know, potentially for, for maple syrup production. Uh, we don't know that for sure yet. The eggs look like mud with some of those egg masses back there as well. Really pretty, you know, insect, plant hopper. Usually when you see it, it looks like this, or you, you see the nymphs. Um, I've seen a lot of them down in Pennsylvania. Um, it has moved into Massachusetts, so it's getting very close. It has expanded in Massachusetts the last few years. So we know that, you know, it potentially can get to Maine. Um, they just did a new report on areas that could potentially be infested and it could establish and along the coast of Maine is pretty much in there. If you look at the new hardiness zone map, you see why because everything was, you know, advanced a, a couple of, of zones. So, you know, it is, the risk is there. Um, you know, it's not super high risk for most of Maine, but southwestern Maine along the coast and in some um, inland areas as well. It's there. Its favorite host is the tree of heaven, and this is where we have an advantage. We don't have very much tree of heaven in Maine. Um, in other places south of us, there's tons of it. I used to own a house in Manchester, New Hampshire, that had tree of heaven growing out of the foundation. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a crazy plant. And it's often found along rail, rail, railways. And one of the things that's spreading with spotted lanternfly is railroad. Uh, hitches, um, hitches on, on rail cars and goes all over the place because there's all that tree of heaven along the way. So really the highest risk with this one is vineyards. They do feed on apples. They don't seem to kill the trees, but they cause problems for sale of apples because they produce all kinds of honeydew that then causes city mold, which gets all over the fruits. Um, it can be a problem in nurseries as well, maybe maple syrup production. Structures, it, it's a structural pest because again, it feeds that sugar syrup all over the place and makes sticky and you know, it's, it's just a nasty, nasty problem. So that's that's it for insects. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll keep going. Right. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions about insects if anybody has. All right, so looking at invasive aquatic plants, um, this is something that the Department of Environmental Protection has been managing for years. There are uh, 12 plants that are not legal to, to bring into the state of Maine or sell in the state of Maine. Um, here you can see mostly the southwestern portion of the state is where we've been finding these invasive plants. There's a, um, one you know, way up in um, Washington County as well. Um, so you know these, Things like brutal dyad and Eurasian water milfoil and hydrilla, they're showing up. They're a lot worse in Point South. Even New Hampshire has a much worse infestation than we do in Maine. So we're doing a good job of inspecting boats and keeping them out. And it's really important that you know, we do the best that we can to prevent the movement of, of these invasive aquatic plants. Another aquatic threat is the zebra mussel. So in Maine, most of our lakes are too acidic for zebra mussel. But up in northern Maine, there's a few that aren't. And right now, it's knocking on the door. It's, it's in the St. John um, River watershed, both in Quebec and as, as well as in, in New Brunswick. So there's a lot of um, consternation about that, people watching out for that um, up in the St. John um, watershed. Um, uh, another one that's a, a big concern uh, certainly can become a huge problem in, in, in waterways. So I thought I'd finish with creepy crawlies. Jumping worms really broke out this year. The reports, again, over 300 reports of jumping worms. Um, we also have this slug. Um, this one we don't have, but we have another one called Ernie and Peter. Uh, this one is up in the back one. Uh, is a real threat to um, agricultural crops. 
And I'll start out with the amethyst worms or the jumping worms or the crazy worms or whatever you want to call them. Um, there's three different species that um, can be found. And most of the ones that we have are amethyst agrestus, uh, there's amethyst copiaensis, and um, something called the dwarfi, which I can't think of the first part of it. But um, you know, these are like any other earthworm, they look very similar, except for when they're mature, their propellum is kind of a milky white, but sometimes gray color. It's smooth. Um, it's at in segments 14, 15, and 16 from the head. And these move like a snake. They move very fast. They shed their tail if you grab them. They reproduce parthenogenetically, so they reproduce very quickly. Populations can soar very quickly. And um, as was noticed by people this year, we had some people reporting tens of thousands of them that they were collecting. So there's a, we can, they can really come in pretty hard. So the one that we have most is Amethyst agrestis, but the uh, the smaller uh, Topiolensis is out there as well. And what makes them really easy to pass along is the cocoons that they make. So this is kind of like winter moth, where the cocoon actually looks like soil, only it's much smaller than the, the winter moth cocoon. So it, it's very difficult to see or find, very easy to move around on equipment or on plants and in composts and leaves and just about anything, basically. And so we have jumping worm reported in 13 of 16 counties now. Um, here you can see 2023 is the darker brown here, how many we had you know, before that, there weren't all that many reports. Um, this past year, they just broke out all over. I think that the really wet season made it really easy for them to reproduce. I think that the word got out, people were looking for them more and reporting them a whole lot more. They've probably been around all along, maybe at lower levels where people weren't finding them. They first came into Maine in the early 1900s in greenhouses, so they've been around for a very long time. Um, unfortunately, we don't really know a lot about what kind of effects they're going to have. We know that in the forest, they can really disrupt root systems. They totally change the soil um, in areas where they've had them for a while. Pretty much all the roots are above ground. They cause a lot of, of stress for trees. They're re really worried about them and have been doing more research almost than anywhere else in Vermont because they're concerned about their effects on the maple um, industry up there. Uh, Joseph Flores has been working on them for probably eight years now. We had him come to the Maine Invasive Species Network meeting, I think it was eight years ago, um, talking about them. And they do, they completely change the soil. Their castings are are almost like coffee grounds or even worse than that, very hard castings, um, not like other earthworms. They don't go down and mix things into the soil. They stay at the surface and feed on all the organic matter. So they'll eat away all the compost, all the wood chips, you know, whatever is there, the leaf litter, they'll go through that and leave behind these, um, these castings that are not good soil and they can run off easily, they can easily be compacted. So it, it really disrupts the, the system, but there's not a lot of research that shows exactly what they're doing to plants, other than they seem to, in, in the forest, they cause a quick pulse of a lot of nutrients because they feed on all that stuff and poop it all out and you get this big um, rush of nutrients and then nothing happens. So you don't get that normal, you know, our forests normally are getting this very slow leakage of, of nutrients all the time, and that's that's what maintains them. So when you get this big pulse, that's actually not very good for the plants. And then they get started afterwards, that's even worse. So it's it's something we really want to keep out of forest more than anything else. Um, we know that they're in nurseries, we know that they're in people's yards, we know they're all over. Um, so we're not going to be able to regulate them or stop them but um, maybe we can keep them out of the forest at least. So, you know, they do, they get spread around in plants. We know we work with nurseries and we find them in nurseries and make them aware of that. Um, there have been reports that they've been in composting um, programs. People get a load of compost and they find jumping worms and they think they came with the compost. I'm not totally sure that's always true. Um, we've been doing a number of composting operations and found no jumping worms. 
and you know, even you know, people have been reporting them, so I think that they may have already been there. You put down this great food source and they go right to it and invest it, but I don't know that for sure. There's, there's a real need for a lot more research on these. We have come out with some best management practices for plant sellers, nurseries, and also for composters or people that are making soil materials or, or doing mulches and things like that. Just trying to get them to be more aware, looking to see if they have an infestation. You know, one of my concerns is that in the, in the composting operation, when you heat it up to the level that you know finished compost is going to be at, it actually does kill the worms and the cocoons. But then if you store that somewhere that's not protected, it can get reinfested. And that's one of the BMPs is to put it on concrete or you know some sort of impervious surface and, and try to keep the worms away from. We don't want people to use them for fishing because then they might throw them out in the forest. So that's that's a big concern that we have. Um, actually, this is from Minnesota, but our IFMW is starting to put out the message as well um, when they're talking about you know not releasing your bait fish and your ice fishing. We're also putting out this you know don't release any bait, including worms, um, because we don't want it in the forest. So be on the lookout for slugs uh, on Vinyl Haven. We have a population of this Aryan eater slug, pretty big slug, kind of purplish. Um, it doesn't seem to feed on much other than maybe some detritus. We're not, not all that worried about that particular slug. But this one, Aryan vulgaris, that they have up in Quebec right now, um, has come over from Europe. In Europe, it's a major vegetable pest. And up in, in Quebec, they're starting to see it. It'll feed on all kinds of vegetable plants very voraciously. And unfortunately, it can cross with Arianator and it makes even a worse. The, the, the hybrids are even worse. They, they feed even more voraciously on crops. So we're working with the Border Patrol and the folks up at CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection um, folks, to Try to keep this out of Maine because and we obviously don't want it alone and we don't want it to mix with area neighbors. So this is one that we're hoping if you see slugs like this, that you're going to report them to us. So again, you know, it is widespread um, in Europe. It's a huge problem and um, the, the hybrids are even worse. Can you um, the color and size pretty much gives it away. Yeah, the purple or red, very bright red color of them jumps out at you pretty much. Um, we do have, I didn't bring these with me, but we do have postcards on this one as well um, that I can make available that um, give you a little bit more information about how to identify them. And even some other models that we'd like you to, to be reporting as well. They're becoming more and more of a problem nationwide. But there's a lot more damage on, on crops, especially from, from different types of mollusks. So last but not least, I'm going to talk about some bee bullies. So how many of you know of the Varroa mite? So the Varroa mite is, you know, when, when we talk about colony collapse disorder, that's the cause of colony collapse disorder not pesticides, not anything else. Varroa mites are wiping out honeybees, basically. And if you don't manage them properly in your bee yard, you're going to lose your bee, basically. So Jennifer Lund is our state apiarist. She was an amazing catch for me back about six years ago. And she is respected across the country as being a foremost authority on bee culture and even native bees and other um, invasive wasps and things like that. But um, if you if you keep bees, you should be registering your bees. It's required by the law. And if you haven't had um, Jennifer come out and visit your bees and, and give you, you know, some help, I recommend that you schedule an uh, inspection by Jennifer. And you know, we are always on the lookout for Gorilla mite levels and making sure that they don't spike because that's that's how people lose their bees over the winter, especially. Um, there's a new um, kid in town that is in Australia that we don't want to get 
In Maine, it looks like this. It's quite a bit smaller than the Varroa mite. So the Varroa mite, if I had one on me, it would be just gigantic thing on my shoulder. That's how big they are compared to the bees, and that's where they suck the life out of the, the bees. The triple aps is um, triple alaps is another one that's very similar. It gets multiple um, mites on the bees, and, and again, suck them dry. Basically, they get on um, the pupa as well, just like the uh, the varroa mite. Right now, they are in Australia. They're causing a huge problem in Australia. Um, they're trying to figure out a way to keep them out of the United States. They're much harder to find, so they're trying to come up with um, eDNA ways of finding them. That's a new way of detecting invasive species is to look for environmental DNA. Um, there's a lot of genetic work going on with honeybees right now to try to isolate um, things like viral diseases and, and bacterial diseases, as well as these potential parasites, so that you can just take a sample from your dead bees and send it to a lab and find out you know, what you've got without um, a lot of work because they can just do it with genetic analysis. So here you can see the difference between the varroa mite and the triple A laps. Um, varroa mites are quite a bit bigger, almost larval bees here. And um, so many different ways to report invasive species. And there's lots of resources on the state website. There is the main.gov slash invasives to bring you to a page that has information about all the different agencies that manage invasive species. We have our gut pest website that you can go to to help identify both pest problems as well as beneficials that are out there that are helping to manage pest problems. Um, University of Maine has a similar site, their home and garden IPM. On the site has kind of a similar setup as, as our um, gut test site where you can look at pictures and identify problems and then learn about how to manage them in multiple different ways. And if you want a copy of the presentation, you can you know, hit the QR there if you want. And um, with that, I'll leave it there for now. Well, happy holidays and good questions.